This is the city, Los Angeles, California. There are many well-known residential areas here. Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Holmby Hills. But as a business address, it's hard to top Wilshire Boulevard. Wilshire runs 16 miles from downtown Los Angeles through Westwood and Santa Monica to the Pacific Ocean. A panorama of glamour, glass, and enterprise. On its way, the famous street bends through MacArthur Park and then straightens out for the Miracle Mile. It passes the County Museum of Art and many interesting places to shop. One store will sell you clothes that have been worn only once or twice by famous film stars. Another specializes in apparel for the tall and lean woman. A third carries styles for the small women who wear size nine only. The boulevard is lined with 37 banks, 10 hotels, 17 department stores, and 54 office buildings. Most of the businesses in the city are reputable. They serve the people and they deliver what they promise. Once in a while, one comes along that doesn't. When I hear about them, I go to work. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. October 6th, it was fair in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery homicide. The boss is Captain Hugh Brown. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It was 10.30 p.m. It was a quiet night. We caught up on our paperwork while we had the chance. What's the trouble? Nothing too serious, just a slight case of the gout. In the neck? No, in the hair. Of course in the neck, Joe. It's called the infliction of nobility, you know. I thought you only got gout in the foot. You get it anywhere if you're prone. A doctor told you that? Didn't need to. It runs in the family. It's hereditary. It's also caused by the wrong kinds of food, isn't it? That's right. That's why I always watch what I eat. You do? Just a twinge now and then. It'd be real bad if I didn't watch it. Yeah. I know an orchestra leader's got it right in the elbow. His leading arm. Real painful. Of course, I don't eat like he does. Never touch sweets. Go easy on fats of all kinds. Is that so? Oh, yeah. I have to have special diets at home. It's hard, but it's the price my family pays for the complaint of kings. No, mine's the one marked double-double. Well, why is that? Double sugar, double cream. Robbery homicide Friday. Yeah. Where is that? Right, I got it. Yeah. We're on our way. What's going down? Two Adam 8 answered a 415, but they didn't find a fight. What'd they get? A dead body. At 10.45 p.m., we drove over to 916 West Evergreen. It turned out to be an old, run-down apartment building in East Los Angeles. Sergeant Friday, in here. You won't remember me, sir, but you lectured my class on crime scene preservation up at the academy. Oh, sure. Phillips, isn't it? Ken Phillips. Yes, sir, that's right. You asked some good questions. Just graduate? Yes, sir, two weeks ago. What's the matter? Are you all right? Sure, I'm fine. Perfect. Stuffy in there, that's all. I see. My partner's inside, Steve Nelson. I'm on my way out to the car to sit on the radio. You better get to it then. Yes, sir. Here's your ambulance slip. We've kept the place clean for you. Nobody's been in or out. Good. See you. Looked a little peaked, didn't he? Just the way we did on our first DB call. Joe, Bill, Nelson. Looks like you two will be working overtime. It never fails. What do you got here? 10.32 p.m. received a 4.15 fight. This address, door was wide open when we got here. No fight in progress. That's right, dead body in the bedroom. Looks like gunshot wounds. Anything else? The 4.15 was reported by the manager of the place. His name's Jeffries. He lives in the apartment next door. I figured you'd want to talk to him. Yeah. The rest you can see. Is it all right if we get back in the field? No, we'd like you to hang in here a while. Gann and I have got some interviewing to do. We'll get you out as soon as we can. Right. Looks like gunshot wounds.
This slug hole, one of them might have passed through. Somebody was eating sandwiches, peanut butter. 38. It's a pretty big knife for peanut butter. He didn't live alone. She left some of her clothes behind. There's an overturned chair. This jacket matches his trousers. Right. This must be his ID. Mm-hmm. It's a driver's license. Herbert Jackson, age 34. It's a North Hollywood address. That could mean he didn't live here. That raises a question, doesn't it? Yeah. Who does? <laughs> Eleven fifteen p.m. While I called SID for a print man and a photographer, Bill questioned the apartment building manager. Yes, well, I suppose you know you interrupted my concerto. Mr. Jeffries? Uh-huh. This better be important. Police officer, I'd like to talk to you. If it's about that fight, forget it. It stopped. A man's been shot. I guess that. I heard the gun. We've got some questions to ask you. What for? The man's dead, isn't he? That's right. Well, your questions aren't going to help him, are they? No, sir, but they'll help us. To catch his killer, you mean you're wasting your time. How's that? The courts protect the guilty these days, not the innocent. Now, the drafts of these holes are terrible for my instrument. If you've got to ask those questions, come on inside. I'm really sorry, Mr. Jeffries, about interrupting your practice. I always wear my tails when I rehearse. It's my uniform, much the same as that suit you're wearing is yours. Well, look around, look around. There's justice for you, aren't they? How do you mean? Those are pictures of me. The top one, that's the Philharmonic. That's me in the first chair. That one's in Carnegie Hall. The bottom one, that's Albert Hall. I've played in all the great auditoriums with all the great orchestras. And some fool drove his car into mine. I recovered physically, but my nerves were shattered. I couldn't play anymore. And I didn't even have the satisfaction of seeing the man responsible go to jail. The judge gave him the benefit of the doubt. He must have had a reason. What do you want to know? Ask your questions and get out. You're the manager of this building? That's right. They give me this place free. I collect their rents. Who lives in the apartment next door? I have no idea. Well, somebody signed a lease? Not here. We're not that much in demand. It's strictly month to month. Who pays the rent each month? His name is Joseph Melendez. He pays in cash. That's all I know about him. Any idea where we can find him? No, he comes and goes. Sometimes weeks at a time. Try the racetrack. I think he follows the horses. The apartment next door was vacant? I didn't say that. Melendez usually sublets it, but don't ask me who took it this time. I don't know. I don't pay attention to people like that. I don't like them, and they don't like me. Well, when did you see Melendez last? About a month ago. He must have been here since, though, at least for a short time. His mail's gone, but I didn't see him. Can you describe him? Easily except for the fact he's Mexican-American, he looks like you. Your age, your height, your weight, in other words, average. You never saw the man who sublet the apartment this time. I didn't even know it had been sublet. And you collect the rent. That is right. Well, does the name Herbert Jackson mean anything to you? No, nothing. Did you see a woman enter or leave the apartment next door recently? I told you, I pay no attention to the people in this building. I don't bother them, and they don't bother me. Except tonight. How do you mean? The fight, you reported. Well, they were making so much noise, I couldn't hear my concerto. What kind of noise? Yelling and screaming. The woman's voice was the worst, shrill and piercing. What did it sound like, frightened? Angry? It could have been either. And before you ask, I couldn't make out what they were shouting. Ask the tenant in 101, maybe he did. Who lives in 101? I have absolutely no idea. He's a Hindu man, that's all I can tell you. You couldn't give us his name? Ask him his name, he'll tell you it's Ramond. Now get out. All right, sir, thank you very much. But there's one thing I know for certain. What's that? If you do catch the killer, yes, sir. the court will let him off. Twelve twenty a.m. There were two more apartments on the ground floor. I talked to the occupant of 101. Yes. You're Mr. Raymond? Raman, that is correct. Police officer, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Of course, of course, please, do come in. Oh, I'd like to leave it to Josh, sir. Please make yourself right at home. This is indeed a great honor. I've never before had the pleasure to make the acquaintance of one of you policemen. You are here, no doubt, in connection with that terrible tragedy in the opposite apartment. Yes, sir, that's right. What is your word for it? Ah, yes, homicide. A delightful word. I am a student of your language, son, of your ways. In India, one hears so much about America that it's difficult to separate the false from the true. As a result, I've come here to experience everything for myself, to broaden my outlook. Oh, I've lived in your Beverly Hills, in your Pasadena, and now here. Oh, but I, I talk too much. Please, a thousand apologies. Proceed. All right, sir. Do you know the man who lives in the apartment right across the hall? Alas, no. We were not friends. I saw him in the hall. I did speak with him. But I'm sorry to say that Mr. Jackson did not accept my overtures of friendship. Herbert Jackson. 
You did not know his name. Well, the man who rented the apartment was named Melendez. Ah, yes, but Mr. Melendez brought Mr. Jackson here some ten days ago. I believe you used the term sublet. Sir, it is strange to think of him among the deceased. In India, among the hungry and the ill, death is commonplace. But here, where welfare and well-being are so plentiful, death assumes a delightful excitement. Yes, sir, about Mr. Jackson. Of course. Now, what can I tell you? He received only one letter while he lived here. I regret to say it came from a bill collection agency. But that's not to say he did not have many friends. The phone rang many times. <laughs> How do I know these things? It is my business to know them. You see, since I am studying the habits of Americans, I find it useful to go through the mail and to keep my door always open just a little. For example, I can tell you everything your two policemen in uniforms did and said while they were in the hall. Is that so? Now, what about Jackson? Did you see him tonight? No, sir. I have not seen him since last night when he brought a young lady to live with him. Can you describe her? She seemed thin, sir, undernourished, as so many of your women do. Her hair was brown. She was about uh, this tall. She wore a red skirt. That was very short. I regret to say I do not know her surname. But while they were in the hall, Mr. Jackson addressed her only as darling, and once as Francie. It is a diminutive of Francis, is it not? Yes, sir, it could be. Have you seen her since? Only once, sir. A few minutes after I heard the gunfire. She ran out after the other man who came from the apartment. She called out to him not to leave her in there alone. Could you describe the other man? Well, his hair was white. His height? I would say about five and a half of your feet. He wore a yellow jacket, which I believe is called a windbreaker. Now, you're sure he and that girl ran from the apartment after the shots were fired? I am sure, sir. That is correct. How many shots did you hear? Three. All right, sir, thank you very much. You've been a big help. There's just one thing. Yes. Why didn't you tell the other policemen what you've told me? Sir, I'm here to observe, not participate. How'd you make out? Man wearing a yellow windbreaker, 5'6", white hair. Girl, sometimes known as Francie, 5'4", brown hair. Wearing a red miniskirt, both Caucasian. I'll phone it in. I'll check the liquor store downstairs and the gas station across the street. You don't have to. I killed Herb Jackson. a.m. We searched the female suspect's handbag and shook down the male suspect outside the murder apartment. Honest, it wasn't my fault, I swear it. Herb came at me with a knife. He was crazy. I had to shoot him. All right, you want to give us your names? Jack Burke. Herb was my best friend. I knew him for years. Your name, lady? Uh, Francis Burke. You're married? Yeah, sort of. We're common law, but it's the same thing. I want you both to listen to your rights. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you before questioning. We don't need an attorney. It happened like I said. Now, do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Sure. We got nothing to hide. He tried to kill me. All right, let's go inside. Miss, let you and I go in the kitchen. Do I have to? Go ahead. They just want to question us separately. And don't worry, it's no crime to kill in self-defense. I'm glad you did that. It'll be a lot easier without her. How's that? Well, it's all her fault in a way. Is that so? She's a good kid. It's just too easy to put ideas in her head. How do you mean that? Herb Jackson, my best friend, you know. He was always hanging around our apartment, always eyeing Francie. I never blamed him. She's a good looker, but somewhere along the line, he must have talked her into dumping me and going with him. Last night while I was out, he came over, helped Francie pack her things, and moved her out. When I found out about it, I got sore. All right, go on. Real sore, but it didn't last long. Like I said, Herb used to be my best friend. That's the part that really got to me. Francie ain't too bright. You expect something like that from her, but Herb, that cut real deep. What did you do? I got drunk, good and drunk. And this morning, I figured I'd better get her and take her home before Herb left her high and dry. How'd you find out where she was? Francie can't keep a secret. She blabs everything. I just looked up her girlfriends. It took me all day, but I finally found one she'd talked to. What happened when you got here? Well, I made up my mind on the way over. I wasn't going to get into a fight with Herb. I wasn't even going to talk to him. 
but it didn't work out that way. All right. You know what they were doing when I got here? The two of them were sitting on the edge of the bed eating peanut butter sandwiches. Not in the kitchen or out here, in the bedroom. Anyway, I told Francie I was taking her home to pack her things. She started to, and that's when Herb got mad. What did he do? He started yelling at us. He yelled at me to get out, and he yelled at Francie to stay. By then, she'd had enough of him and told him so. That's when he hit her. What did you do? Nothing. I didn't have a chance, because he grabbed that kitchen knife and came at me with it. Yeah. He would have got me right off, but somehow I grabbed his hand and held the blade away. But well, he's as big as me and a whole lot stronger. I yelled to Francie to get help. I figured she'd go next door or something, but she went to the dresser, took out a gun, and threw it to me just as Herb broke away. That's when I let him have it. How many times? Three. He kept coming. It took three bullets to stop him, and that's the truth. I heard the last of that. The girl says the same thing. I figured she would. How's that? Well, if they're telling the same story, they've had plenty of time to rehearse it. Bring her back in. You know, fella, there's something you didn't tell me. Yeah, what's that? Why weren't you here when the uniformed officers arrived? I panicked, that's why. When I saw Herb laying there dead, I just panicked and ran. But it didn't take me long to come to my senses. I knew I didn't do anything wrong. I killed him defending myself, and that ain't a crime, so I came back. I came right back as fast as I could. I have a few questions for you, lady. Yes, sir. We got nothing to worry about. We only did what we had to. Say, listen, am I going to get treatment for this here bruise? Why does it bother you? No, it don't hurt too bad, but I want treatment. A little later. Would you mind telling me why you ran out after the shooting? I ran because he ran. I wasn't going to stay in here alone with Herb in there dead. Freeman? Joe? What do you got? In the bedroom. Who's he? Print man. What do you need prints for? I told you I did it. He claims it was self-defense. You don't buy it, huh? I don't know, Carl. I'll see what I can turn for you. Officer Freeman began to dust for prints. Like all fingerprint experts, he uses different kinds of powder. On metal objects, a non-magnetic powder is used, ground aluminum. It clings to the invisible moisture left behind by the touch of anyone's fingers. Transparent adhesive tape is then used to lift the print. The particles of powder cling to it in the exact configurations of the original fingerprint. The print is then transferred to a record card, which is marked with a case number, date, time, locale, and other data. On non-metallic surfaces, ground iron darkened with lamp black and called magna powder is used. As before, the particles cling to the invisible traces of moisture left behind by the fingers. This time, the excess powder is removed by a magnet, leaving the print completely untouched. While Officer Freeman completed his work, I went back into the living room. You said your wife took the gun from a drawer and threw it to you? That's right. How'd you know it was there? Herb, I saw him put it there. It didn't belong to him. He stole it yesterday. You want to explain that? It belongs to a friend of ours, Mike Watson. Francie and me, we got an extra bedroom in our apartment, so we rented to Mike. Herb took the gun out of Mike's room last night when he came to get Francie. Ain't that right? Yeah, that's right. Tell him what Herb said when he stole it. He said he was going to use it on Jack if he made trouble. Joe. See, he meant to kill me all along. Well, you can see that, can't you? Okay, Joe, I'm finished till the photog gets you. How's it look? A lot of prints everywhere. And you can't print the gun. Not till the photog finishes. Can't tell too much till after elimination. When are you going to take your suspects in? We haven't charged them yet. Anything on that knife? Same story. We'll have to let the photog take the knife to the lab and put it under ultraviolet. Can't be sure if anything will show. Wouldn't handle. But it looks like peanut butter all over the blade. Sorry, Joe. Haven't been much help, have I? I'll run the prints and try for a make, but I've got a feeling you were looking for something special, like everything wiped clean. Maybe he's telling the truth. There's only one trouble. What's that? There's no maybe about that dead guy on the bed, is there? Okay, I'll get in touch with this Mike Watson, find out if his gun was stolen yesterday. Right. He didn't find anything, did he? It's too early to tell. I know he didn't. He couldn't. You want to know why? Suppose you tell me. Because there ain't nothing to find. Joe? Kelly, in the bedroom. I suppose you think that guy in there with a camera is going to come up with something. Well, he ain't. Like I told you, there ain't nothing to find. 
What's he doing in there, anyway? Photographing the body before the coroner examines it. You mean somebody else is coming? We'll be here all night. Come on, I told you how it happened. Take my word for it. You'll save a lot of time. Well, now, fella, that's something we don't have to worry about. We got a lot of it. Fifth report on the gun. Yeah. Mike Watson called Rampart Division, reported it missing. When? Tonight. What time? 20 minutes after the shooting. Said it was stolen yesterday. He even named the guy who stole it, Herb Jackson. When you ran out of here, where did you go? How do I know? I just ran. I told you I panicked. You didn't stop and make a phone call. No. Why'd I do that? I told you I came straight back here. That's the truth, ain't it? That's right. You could have called Mike Watson. You could have told him to report his gun missing. Yeah, I could have, but I didn't. I didn't have to. It was. Sarge? What's the use to call somebody and tell them a gun is missing when it's missing? Better tell me how you want that bullet hole shot. I don't think it's going to show up too well. Suppose I point it out. Good deal. We'll have to move this bed. You want to give us a hand, Carl? Yeah. That ought to do it. Hold it a minute. There's something we didn't see before, and I want you to get a good shot of this. His hand? No, that cigarette butt between his fingers. How much longer are you going to keep us here? There's just one more thing we have to know. What's that? Now, you knew Herb Jackson pretty well, is that right? I told you that. And you'd be familiar with his physical traits? Absolutely. I told you he was my friend. Was Herb Jackson right-handed? Yeah. Why? Was he, lady? Uh, yeah, I think so. What do you want to know for? What's so important about it? Now, you said he came at you with a knife in his right hand. He was also smoking a cigarette when he died. What's left of it still between the fingers of his right hand. Now, a man who comes at you with a knife doesn't hold a cigarette in the same hand. Now, does he? Hang on a second. I... There wasn't a fight, was there? There was. Now, you argued. You raised your voice. We've got a witness who heard you. Then you shot Herb Jackson three times. Now, isn't that right? No, now, just a minute. Then you knocked over the chair, brought in the knife, dropped it on the floor, added the peanut butter to explain why he had a knife in the bedroom, all after you killed him. No, I told you the truth. That cigarette butt says you're lying. I told him it wouldn't work. I told you him. You keep quiet. I didn't want to lie to you. He made me. He did this to Shut me. Shut up. Herb didn't have the knife. He didn't try to kill him. Herb tried to reason with him, but he wouldn't listen. He, he was crazy mad when he got here, and he had the gun with him. He even said he came to kill you him. You shut up, you no good little tramp. Now shut up! All right, take it easy, fella. What do you mean, take it easy? She just threw my life away. You're wrong about that. You did when you took his. <laughs> you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 28th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the suspect guilty of 187 PC, first degree murder, which is punishable by life imprisonment or death in the gas chamber. Upon further investigation, it was found Frances Burke was in no way implicated in the murder, and her initial support of Burke's story had been caused by her fear of the accused. No charge was brought against her. She was released from custody. 